Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us all today. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, for me to be here introducing Awa Ibrahim. Um, just to give you a bit of context, when designing this summit, we felt that it was paramount that our attendees left with not just knowledge, but also skills and the ability to share ideas to bring about the changes that they want to see. So as such, we wanted this session to be a true sharing time. So this workshop will explore the role of uh, legislative policy making as a mechanism of change. And we hope it will provoke you to reimagine the involvement of African individuals and communities in choosing their future. We're proud to present the incredible Owa Ibrahim to guide us through exploring the role of policy making as a mechanism of change. Owa uh, was pre is president of the Peace Institute with offices in the US, Italy, and Nigeria. Uh, and she is an internationally known human rights lawyer, author, and mother who was awarded the Sokharov Prize in 2005. She defended over 150 cases involving women sentenced to de death, uh, by stoning and children sentenced to amputation of limbs under the Sharia law. Uh, prior to launching her practice, um, she was a secretary in the Ministry of Justice in the Bauchi State. Awa has taught at Harvard University, the University of Rome, and over a dozen universities around the world. She has given uh, speeches in over 30 cities globally, as well as TED Talk at The Hague. And she's the founder of the project Mother Without Borders, which focuses on diverting youth from extremism. She really sees uh, she, uh, she uh, really seeks to offer young people an alternative to violence. So without third you, and because the personality speaks like by herself, uh, I welcome to the floor Owa Ibrahim. Thank you so much, Alice. That was very generous and kind. Wherever you are joining from. Thank you for joining. Thank you for giving us the honor of your time. And we don't take it for granted whatsoever. Uh, I am not too sure I am qualified to speak about policy and legislation uh, as a mechanism for change. But I will speak to what I think I know and I'll try to speak um, maybe just about five, 10 minutes. And I'll, I want us to have a conversation. So I will throw things at you and throw back at me in our conversation so that we could speak to what we want to hear. But I want to thank the London School of Economy uh, for this privilege and for the Furos Leiji Center. I want to thank Daniel Chukukelu and all his team that has been really on me on this issue. And I want to thank Elise and uh, Nina most especially permit me to thank Mubarak. It's a young man that I, I met so briefly and for him to think about me about 10 years after I said there is a treasure in him. And I really think we are lucky to have him uh, as part of us today. Um, what the School of Economy has oh, given you or has given people that have passed through it, a lot of community of policy makers and policy thinkers. Uh, it has also given you opportunity to learn, to develop, and to connect. And above all, it has opened the world to you. But you came to London School of Economy with your own world. And I hope that you will always think about the world that you came from, because when you go back there, that is where it happened. And I will start by saying, I was, everybody has a story. And my story is this, that I became educated by accident. And I became a lawyer by accident. Nina just said I went to teach in several Ivy Leagues by accident. So when I became a lawyer, I started law practice, more from a perspective of, um, what you used to call the church and bail or road traffic law. And then I rose to defend in the Ministry of Justice, a section of the law in the Northern Nigeria called 221. That means couple homicide punishable with death. I never came into law to change anything. Like I said, I became a lawyer by accident. 
I came into law to play my part. I had a passion. I didn't even know what a law is before I became. But when I got it, I had a passion for it. So let me pause and say, what is your passion? And so that passion is something I want us to sort of, you know, glean and see how we could talk that passion as you go to the field. Do you want the passion to move toward making change policy wise? And how can you do that? And you know, the theory of change is a whole set of conversation. Uh, change is uh, immediate, whether change comes slowly, whether change is abrupt. The theory is massive, so I don't want to go into it, but just to drop it, that when we think about policy and mechanism for change, for me, it started with my passion. My passion was low and I was not ready to change anything. But change came to me and uh, sort of the mechanism came and we use it. So when we were doing our cases of um, women sentenced to death by stoning in North Nigeria, which introduced Sharia in 1999, we never knew where we were going. We just wanted to do our case. In some of the places we have traveled to, there were no roads. Uh, donkeys cannot go there. The only best way we can get there are like two legs. And sometimes we take the camels, sometimes we take horses and donkeys, but we never set out to change nothing. But we change found us on the field and our activism helped change to happen. So we were focused, we had passion. We know the dynamics we are working in. We work within our dynamic. We were firm, but we were flexible. We always had a plan and we know the law. We sort of try to know the law and I always say to law students, if it's possible to chew it and to digest it and to live it. So all this passion came together to help me publish a book. And the book is titled uh, Practicing Sharia, the seventh strategy of how to achieve justice in Sharia courts. Now this strategy book is a strategy I will want to leave with you. And I will speak to both Mubarak and Nina. The book is $50, but I'm giving it free for anybody that wants it. Even though it's targeted on Sharia, uh, the strategy had helped me in boardrooms. As a president of the Peace Institute, it has helped me to smooth my way, even in policy making. And the first one is how do you understand your dynamics and work within your dynamics? How do you attention to details and have a creative approach? How do you be focused and stay focused on issues that you're passionate about? How are you firm and flexible? How do you play to your strengths? And what are the plans you have? And for me, I have a strategic plan, it's a four, four-stage plan. Plan A, B, C, D, A is my plan, B is a plan for the other, just in case mine doesn't work in, in defense. C is uh, what I introduced in the courtroom I work to persuade my, the people I'm appearing before. And the fourth one is always an exit strategy. So what is your plan? Thinking about your passion. How do you think global and act local? Or some of the... Plan. I mean, some of the issues I had to deal with, and I, I sort of worked toward it to be able to achieve my own passion. Now, like I was talking about changing, the, the law was changing because of our activism. We didn't have the tools per se to make that change happen. But the change came and happened because we brought the issues out, both locally, nationally, and it became international. And based on that, I think we have helped also change things beyond West Africa and, and still going on. But let me finally mention three issues and I'll open up for our conversation. The first issue I wanted to say is that a lot of you that are joining are likely to be students. Um, so you have this zeal and passion. Things are not going the way it should go, the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 opportunities, uh, diff challenges, yet opportunities. And we want to go and change the world. So you want to take the world by storm. 
it's the right passion. You are on the right track. There's nothing wrong with that. And no, is great. But at times with that comes a bit of beyond that knowledge. And that is what I call wisdom. At times it doesn't come. You have to trade through it gradually. So keep that, 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 that um, passion you have, that vibrancy that is in you, that radical ideas that you want change to happen. But remember that at times that policy, that mechanism to make it happen may be slow. It shouldn't discourage you, but it should enhance your strength. The governance structure in any given society you find themselves has sustained itself for so long because people that have it wanted it that way to some extent. So when you come with some radical ideas to want to push change happen, you will have a lot of pushback. Stay focused. Don't lose that focus and don't lose that passion. Don't lose who you are. The second thing I wanted to say is uh, the issue of what you see as a picture, as like a specific thing that you want to pursue. Uh, for me, it was low. I don't know what is your leaning. Are you leaning toward education in your place where you come from like my place and education is the one thing i want to get it done so that people can scale the scale the hurdles of life are you thinking more of okay the covid 19 has happened now there is more opportunities open in, techn in the technology world where the school or the virtual learning is what is it for the next generation for the future where is your focus in that focus is where I think we can strengthen our conversation as we open it and how we could sort of put a kick starting in that, but knowing that within your own context, it may not, it may not be the reality that you see in London or elsewhere because our context is different and I'll speak to it in Q&A. And I think even as we have that passion and that focus and having a plan and a backup, I know that you are coming from a, a specific context and an identity and this value set. And based on all this, you have to play the game um, as much as you can to be able to reach your passion. And finally, I wanted to add to say, I'm sure you had it in this, com in this um, conversation and conference, that Africa needs you especially those Africans. We desperately need you. The world need you. So because we need you, we need you not only to have knowledge and wisdom, uh, we need you to know where you are coming from. We need you to know our history. And I always say the more you think you know, that is the more you should know. And knowing your history, Last month was Black History Month in the United States. And so I took off thinking to myself, I would take two hours every single day to learn about an icon and the fight for the civil rights in the United States. And the more I read, the more I get to know them, the more I really don't know anything. I've come across people like, you will all know Martin Luther King, but I don't know if you know James Cones. James Cone was the father of liberal theology. I read about Malcolm X. I read about Baba Shi. I don't know whether I've ever had Baba Shi. Know where you are coming from. Know the substance you are made of. And that would help you even have a greater passion and greater mission for the future. So having said that, I want to say beyond every other thing that we can take an idea and we should choose for the most part, as Martin Luther King will say, don't crawl with the idea. Actually, don't walk with the idea. And that's what I do. I choose also not to run with ideas. As much as possible, I choose to fly. What is your ideas? What are your passion? Where is your direction? And how can you fly? Not crawl and don't stand still. 
So I want us to go ahead and, and sort of have some conversation around us. So much I've thrown on your, on your ears now, and I look forward to um, learning from you. Over to you, Elise. Thank you so much for these words of wisdom, if I might say, as you're pointing out before. Uh, I think what we could do to begin this conversation and come back to uh, what you were saying right before would be to create, if you allow me, a poll uh, asking participants here, what is your passion? Uh, what is your focus? What what do you what change do you want to bring? So I guess we can start maybe with a, with a poll, get an idea of, of what the audience uh, think and then I think I will just walk us through the different questions. Please participants don't hesitate to ask questions on the Q&A. We're going to read through them and I think Owa would be really happy to help answer some of your doubts and 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 questions. So um, maybe if I if you allow me I would go with the first question in the Q&A which is a more practical question. Uh, someone was asking you um, was telling you so Andamu Somba was saying thank you for giving us free access to your book uh, where can we actually access it I think a lot of people on the platform would like to so I need you to take all the pools of the numbers of people that need the book okay. and as many as they need I'll give it for them free I need to coordinate with Mubarak and we need to get the address and we'll send it to them at their address and if we have chunk of them in a certain place we'll put it together and Mubarak will be able to deliver that that's amazing. That's good. Thank you very much. So I guess I can only encourage participants to to let us know if they would be interested um, in receiving this book and we will coordinate everything. Another question that was asked to you um, by Marat uh, Ashinafi is actually, as an African diaspora from London, what steps do you think I should take towards pursuing a career in social policy to help bring more freedom human rights and equality for women in country of origin. Uh, was there any indication of the country of origin of the person? Uh, actually, maybe Merit, if you would like, you can raise your hand. And if you do so, you can actually come on stage and explain to us where you're from. Ah, OK, he's, he's mentioning Ethiopia and Eritrea. OK, um, uh, I, I think issue of social change and especially from the context that he was speaking about, I'm sure he knows much more than I ever imagined. But from I could glean from the uh, the media and sources that it seems that region of the world is is moving much faster and more forward. Uh, we also have uh, a female in, in in terms of leadership position in I think Ethiopia, uh, and then her handling of the COVID nineteen situation I think was one was uploaded globally. Uh, I don't know about Eritrea much, uh, but I also know they're extremely progressive. What can the person do? Uh, and I, I don't know from which angle you are coming from, what, what specific thing the person want to focus on. But assuming it is issues of women and social change, women issue is massive. Social change issue is massive. Youth issue is massive. Right now I'm working on uh, Mothers Without Borders, how to stay away from violent extremism. And I could tell you that I could take every word of that sentence and turn it into a movement itself. So the first thing I would suggest is look for people with um, similar ideas, a similar um, understanding of where you want to head to and how can you collaborate and you have a massive community within the London School of Economy for you to consider having some allies from within. And if you have allies from within, you are likely going to have um, more present when you are when you are on the field. The field could be a very treacherous place, uh, but I never want to discourage anybody at all. But I think where where there exists difficulties, that is where opportunities are even much more. So uh, get some allies, get collaborators, um, identify the issues, and, and, and just go for it. Don't be discouraged by the difficulties on the field because um, there are many avenues you can change. Specifically, what I have done uh, was to 
identify age group for me right now as to how I want to snatch them out of the jar of Boko Haram. So that's what I'm doing, and I'm using STEAM to, be, to do that. So the past uh, five years, I have focused on science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths at a very, very um, grassroots level so that I could see how I could start giving them an alternative to violence. So if they are able to know that they can use common stick from the tree and build a Da Vinci bridge where the old people that they used to carry, now the old people can walk on the bridge and cross a stream and they have that power and ideas change their society. That is where I have, I have been heading to. So I'm not looking for that publicity and I think that we should, that's not what we are for. We are looking for that change that we are not recognized as icons. Uh -uh. We want to do the baby little baby step change in our society. So I want the person to know uh, that the opportunities are out there and identify it can be very little and very drop, uh, drop, drop in the bucket, but that, that's a drop, drop that makes the bucket full um, and go for it. You need collaborators and allies. Thank you very much, Owa, for these words. I see now that uh, Jacob Pele, actually, who talked previously in the grassroots panel, has joined us and is raising his hand. So I'm going to bring him into to the floor so that he can share with us uh, his question. I think. Can you hear me? Hello, Jake. Can you hear Hi. us? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hi, hi ma'am. Um, I am. I am particularly blown away by uh, your humility and uh, the work you do. I'm. 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 I'm blown away. Uh, but just to add to um, your wealth of experience and wisdom when it comes to policy. First of all, you didn't read law by accident. You were. You were primed by God Almighty to do that uh, because of the work you're doing right now. Because this is what I say to people. Uh, sometimes we start something with passion, but then eventually you find out that you need skills. And so if you didn't law, uh, even with your passion, uh, you would have been struggling. But there's an aspect of policy. I, have do I did the first albinism policy uh, in Nigeria, which stands out to be the first policy in the whole world. Um, and then uh, I was also involved in the inclusive education policy, which I chaired and led the team, and it became um, uh, an implementable policy. I have contributed to special education policy. One thing that anybody who wants to do policy must also know, in addition uh, and in complement to the very many strategic steps you have mentioned, is for the individual to understand the system that exists within the area where you're going to do policy. For instance, if you are going to do education policy, you need to understand the education system, how it works, who is who, uh, who can make things happen, what are the processes, what are the systems, who are the critical stakeholders. Uh, all of that are very important. And then um, oftentimes there's, a, there's this saying that there are too many policies in Africa and we're not implementing. This is what I say to people. Let there be policy and we start struggling to implement that no policy at all. So it's a great thing uh, for us to begin to identify that we cannot keep making, um, pushing for advocacy without policy, without evidence-based data that drives the process of what we to achieve and give us that opportunity. So ma'am, Kudos to you. Uh, you are beautiful. You're brilliant. Uh, keep pushing the boundaries. And please, if there's anything we can do uh, with you, uh, the Minister of Women Affairs calls me a he for she. I want to see every woman successful, beginning with my own wife. And I do that. I push her. I tell my wife, she was smarter than me. You're a better speaker than myself. And it's true. And I'm very comfortable being behind her. Uh, than just trying to push her, uh, ask her, to, uh, drag her along. All right, so let me stop here. Thank you. I just want to add to what Jake was saying. Um, I think what she said is apt. Uh, just to add two more, um, maybe a general note to, are there a question, uh, Alice, before I continue? 
Yes, uh, we do uh, have. Can you, ask, can you ask John a question? Then when I uh, answer them, I will come with this so that we allow other voices in. It sounds it sounds perfect. I think uh, then uh, just to speak to what Jake has just mentioned earlier, I think there is a um, there there is a question that kind of like speaks to to the same ideas of like context uh, on how to apply actually change in specific situations. So uh, Nadia Orning is asking, how do you influence policy in political systems that lack legitimacy? Neither politicians nor political institutions are strong enough to serve as agents and mechanism for progress. So what would be what, what would be your input on that? Um, uh, I also have here uh, a question um, from J uh, Jan Obianga, who is asking, how can we be agents of change in countries like Cameroon, Congo or Uganda, where leaders have been in power for over 35 years? Which policies can work since dissenting voices are brutally silenced or corruption and deck. I think we can go with this bunch of questions for now. Okay, so I'm sort of trying to knit in into what Jake was saying earlier. Um, the question about legitimacy um, on one hand and the other one has to do with the agent of change. So it's uh, about the same thing, legitimacy and policy, agent of change. And what Jake was talking about having policies so that whatever it is that we sort of push towards getting policy. Now, I come from northern Nigeria, and I think Jake could make a, come the other side of the country, where the voices of the female is a silent voice. And where you have silent voices that are not, in, especially in the villages, the ones that are up there have maybe have some good fatherism to them. And when you don't have it, it's, it's an issue. So you have to be one, strategic, two, respectful, and third, understand the dynamic and try to work within it. So for us, um, to some extent, poly could, could make a huge dent and make a huge difference and could create that legitimacy that we need. But where it doesn't exist, I don't want us to get discouraged. And this is the tactics and the strategy we use. And I mentioned earlier, this, and I'm talking more of education, uh, addressing a bit of the issue of corruption. I'll come to that in a second. What we did was to identify the, the challenges we have, where we have over 100 million in the northern part of the country with the Sharia states, and 70% of those are out of job. And now we are having army of maybe double the size in children in 20, 30 years to come. So when you are waiting for the politician to make the policy, and she's right in some of the country where you have a sit down leadership that don't want to move an inch, they want the status quo to remain as it is. And so change in the status quo that is remain as it is, is always a difficult change especially when you want to do it from within a government setting. So I encourage, especially students thinking through change, not to look at the status quo, not to look at the structure of the system. Think out of the box. And how do you do it? So this is how I did it. I'm not sure I want to suggest I have to try my way, but think through it. I identify in my own area, in, in the northeastern part of the country, where my mother is Kanuri, my dad is from Gombe. Uh, Kanuri is the Borno where the Boko Haram Caliphate is, and Boko Haram is a terrorist organization in the northern Nigeria. So we identify what we can do with the students in the private schools, not government school. Because like Jack was saying, if you want to do government and getting policy done, uh -uh, it won't work. So we look at the private school, but yet went to the traditional rulers, the emirs, the chiefs, the smaller chiefs in the villages, and said, this is what we can offer. We can offer to help your children know how to make a rocket. And how do we know how to do it? With only a kanwa is like vinegar and nothing else, just vinegar and powder, and everything that we need is there with you. So we just want to experiment something. 
but I'm not a scientist. I teach at the University of Rome. So I asked my student, I need you to give me some experiment about this. We want to generate interest. So we started with a school. By 2019, we had over 200 schools participating, mainly government schools. So we didn't wait for the change to come. The change was coming after us. So at times it's good to work within a structure, but when the structure is corrupt, when the structure is not ready to move, go out of that box. That is what makes you who you are. That's what makes you come out from London School of Economy. If you don't go out of the box, then you are not from London School of Economy. Go out of that box and be creative. And maybe at the end of the day, I'll tell you how I work within the Islamic fundamentalist, how I was able to get results. The same people that want to stone me to death for doing what I was doing became my allies. But you have to understand what is your dynamic. So I'll take a bunch of questions. I don't know how much time we have, and then I'll round up maybe with the last story. I think I think just to 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 come back to the to the to 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 an idea that you mentioned. Uh, a lot of people are asking maybe a more profound, I guess, question. But how do uh, do you consider someone can find its true passion? What do you consider is actually the path for that? And what do you mean by flying instead of crawling, actually? Where do you find your passion? How can you become an agent? Now, if, if uh, I don't come from a comfort zone, I, I, I told you I became, even the Jake said I shouldn't say that. But truly speaking, I was given a marriage at the age of 10. So, assuming, I know I, I just get there and, and, and just get locked up and, and that's all. What 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 triggered me at that time when it was happening, when I was giving out, usually when you giving out, it doesn't happen when you're 12, maybe 13, and the, the ceremony takes place. I ran away. Why did I run away? Two things happened. I, I was in the village choir, and I don't know how many of you know about villages or have, have visited one. Uh, we don't have electricity, no water, no road. It's just, it's just a place of its own. And in the morning, children will come to the square to buy, to buy things to eat. And you know, in the evening, we sit by the moonlight for tales. We told to ask some folk tale. When there is no moon, we dinner. when there's moon, we dance. When there is no moon, we sit with our grandparents for folk tales. That's the life I grew up with. So there was no passion, but the stories that was told by our grandparents of heroes and heroism was something that remained in me. And I always want to be a hero. I want to have the confidence to do something. And that is when I was talking about passion. It's coming from the guts. And in this vein of the, we call it Osei Isla Akara in the South, uh, they wrap it in newspaper when I bought it. And I finished eating my Akara, my Osei, and I discovered that there's a picture of somebody with water, uh, a graduation hat. And, but this confidence in that person that I still remember till tomorrow. And I say, I want to be as confident as that person. So I don't know who are you looking up to. Who do you want to be like? Who do you want to be much more than? And for me, it was the confidence. One of the driving factors where I got my passion was the confidence. The second was my mother. My mother came from her country in her town where her parents are to my village where we had nothing to stay with her children. And she would always say something like, if only I have a little education. If only I have a little education. You guys will not be buying and selling. I was a big hawker, big time hawker. I bought and sell from peanuts to vegetables in the village. She said, I wish you would do that. But that highlamation stuck in my head. And I said, I don't want to be like that. And that is my second passion. And that is what made me to run away. So I don't know where you are driving your passion. If you spend a lot of time on PlayStation, you have no motivation. You didn't create the PlayStation. You didn't create the social media, which is one big drag to use right now. 
it has to be there because this is your time. This is your generation for social media. But when it doesn't add value to what you do, it's not worth it. It's not worth your time. So I would say you look for something, even in the medias that you look at, something that inspirational, something that gives you that drive from inside. Something that helps you to want to be that agent of change. Something that push you through flying. For me, it's like, no, I was still. I'm right now at Oxford. I'm going back to Oxford, not right now. I'm now in, in Charles de Gaulle Airport. But I'm going back to Oxford at the end of the term. I am, I'm going for philosophy. Why should I have how many master's degree? I'm a lawyer, sort of accomplished. Why would I want to be educated anymore? No, I want it because knowledge is never enough. I thrive, I sort of hunger and thirst of the knowledge. That is my passion. And I don't know where you drive yours from. And I want to encourage you beyond anything that we said today, if you go out with something, don't be still. Don't walk. Don't crawl. Don't run. Those two days, take something that would inspire to fly. Just take something. Just even if it's just one thing that you drive from all the conversation. Is it education? Is it uh, making difference in your society using the technology that you've learned, you're learning? Is it something? Fly with it. Alice. Thank you so much, Owa. I just want to share with you uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of positive comment on the chat right now. Uh, thanking you for your really inspiring uh, talk. Uh, a lot of people are saying they feel inspired right now. Uh, and they, they mentioned that obviously education is really important. When you stop learning, you actually, like you almost like start dying. Some people are, are pointing out. Uh, I think another question that is interesting is someone is asking how do you actually overcome negative feedback in these quests for uh, for your passion how do you keep motivated all the way i guess no i don't know for people that are seeing me it's just like i rub it off and uh, don't put energy in the negative the negative will come actually the good book was saying the biggest enemy we have is a member of our household. So it will come even from within. Anything you do, there's going to be a pushback. Everything we do. Don't put your energy there. Make a reverse psychology or play, uh, play a game with it. Um, it around. If you turn it around, you add more value to who you are. And when you don't give it traction, it loses the traction. So the, the advice I'll give you is please take that negative energy right away somewhere, put it in a box, a bottle, lock it and throw it in the sea and focus on what is right. It's for me, it's the parable of the sowing and reaping. When you sow good, you reap good. When you sow not so good, you may not reap the you may reap the opposite of good. But let me end because I think we just have five more minutes, unless if there is any pressing question. Um, with a story of how I work within my system. I hope it will encourage somebody here. In 2001, when we had the woman sentenced to death by stoning, and we went to defend her, we we did it because we were in the position to help. What we have is law. I wasn't paid. I always say my mission is for the powerless and the voiceless, for the illiterate and for the poor. If you fall within those categories, that is where I belong. So I don't, I am not, I am not motivated by anybody's money. You don't have enough money to pay me to do anything. Actually, it's an insult for you to pay. So I, I took my motivation because I'd been given, I want to give back. And through it, I have reaped good. But when we were doing this case, there was a radio interview I granted to BBC. And it's a simple question. It's turning to death in the Quran. 
And my answer was simple. I really have read the Quran since I was young, but I don't think so. And there was a massive pushback in the same media and in the North we listen more. So our main media is the radio. And so there's a big call by the clerics that said I was anti-Islam and I was anti-Sharia. And that is still I am not. So I called the reporter that interviewed me and asked him, can you please introduce me to them so that I can visit with them and you know, just tell them what I'm doing, whether they'll understand. I know my dynamic. I choose to work with my dynamic. I choose to work within my dynamic. So I wanted to see the mullahs, the Islamic clerics. And he told me, it's not a good idea. He doesn't think it's a good idea. I persisted and he, at a point he said, if I introduce you to them, I will not be responsible. So I said, yes, I accept it. He was kind to introduce me to them and they were kind to see me after over nine months trying to see them. And they decided to see in the central mosque in Abuja. And I think I'm properly dressed, but I'm not, I'm not dressed enough to enter a mosque. So I was totally covered. How can we be sensitive when we walk, when we want to create a mechanism for change policy? How can we be sensitive so that we can get it right? So I was sensitive going into the mocks to make sure that I don't offend them by how I appear before them. I made photocopies of my case and I went. There were eight of them sitting on chairs. Halfway to them was a chair by the wayside. I entered. Approaching them, I saw the chair, but I didn't go to the chair and I went toward them. Getting close to them, I decided to kneel down and to sit on the floor. And they echoed at the same time, no, 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 stand up, go sit on that chair, they said to me. And my culture didn't allow me to look at the men on their faces because they are my fathers. So I was looking on the floor <clears throat> and I said to them, how can I, your daughter, sit on a chair when you, my fathers, are sitting on a chair? Remember, I had approached them, I have kneeled down, I have sat on the floor, my eyes looking down. I will not accept to sit on the chair because I'm not in that category. I didn't gain feeling I'm the lawyer. Mm -mm. You go to the field, you want to create a change, don't go in with horns and feeling, oh, you are the, the, the thing happening now, you are the main thing happening. Mm -mm, it won't happen. At times, humility helps. In my situation, that's my dynamic. So they said to me, are you the lawyer? I was looking on the floor. I said, as you please, yes, I am. Are you Hawaii Ibrahim? I said, as you please, yes, I am. But I said more. I said, I'm a foolish lawyer. I'm a city lawyer. I want to go out there to do some good, but I really don't know how to do it. I did not speak to their call for me as an anti-Islamic lawyer, anti-Sharia. I didn't speak to that. I told them how foolish I was and I was in that space to seek their wisdom and to their knowledge. That was why I was there. They listen. At the end of the day, they told me two things. We will not technically support what you are doing, but would also not oppose you. Now it's important to understand that was my dynamic and I choose to understand it and to work within it. Is it Ethiopia? Is it Eritrea? Is it Cameroon? Is it any of you attending from any part of the world or even in London? What is your dynamic? How do you work with it? Humility not achieve any result in some dynamic. At times you have to confront it. And that is why if you read a little bit into the book, you will see more strategies of how I use within mine and you can always turn it to fit your own. But I want to end by saying, 
The wall is in your hand. You've had it so many times. We are not only leaders of tomorrow. We are not only framers of tomorrow. For you to get there, you not only have to shake off a lot of things that is thrown at you and stay focused and be focused and stay there and understanding your dynamics. I want to encourage each of you listening. We all have to take to make the world a better place than we found it. And you have a platform and you have a name. London School of Economy is a name. Just don't use it and, and float it around. You should do good. The field is wide. The laborers are few. You have been called into this to go out there to create a change. Whether it is a mechanism of fit through policy, or it's only by your pure, strong power inside of you as a power of one. Don't hold back. Always remember that when you sow, you will reap. Alice. I think. Thank you very much for these words. I think um, it's interesting because a lot of participants are talking a lot about the role of education, culture, humility, as you're mentioning, for, for, for bringing about change. I just uh, would like to ask you a question that came up that I think is important and interesting. Someone is asking you, Abdullah Karim is asking you, do you think African governments should actually create a budget for for create you know, like for young creative African kids to 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 get them in the villages, identify them, give them their like the wings that you're mentioning? Do you think that's something? I think it would be a great idea, but I have sort of in a way felt. If we are waiting for the gap to do that, we may wait for so long a time and the movement is slow. Why would they want to create a creative but a budget so that you they can encourage creativity when it is when you are not creative that they benefit with your ignorance so that they can rule you more, so that they can put you down and ask their children and children children to rule you down to put their knee on your neck. Mm -mm. Don't 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 think that way. Think beyond them. A lot of them have been there before our great grandparents were even born. With their knees on our own knee or their knees on our neck. Because they want to keep ruling. So I would suggest that maybe we should start looking beyond government doing this, government doing that, and say, no, it's my turn to do this, and the government will look for me and follow me. But then you, how will you get the resource? Where will you find the resource? I think that's a big question. Now we have some few philanthropists that are out there trying to see how they could help. And I'll mention three of them. I know there's one in Morocco. Uh, he's doing a lot of things uh, and I'm more than happy to share uh, the information uh, with Mubarak. Mubarak, if he's on this platform, please send it around. I don't have it readily here because I'm just jumping out of a plane. Uh, I can see his, the email of the organization. They are looking for creative mind. If you have a creative mind, they are ready to put their money where their heart is. There is one in Kenya, I think he was his hasha, a similar story, how he had no shoes. Now he's controlling a massive amount of amount. He's a banker and he's also putting his heart where his mouth is, uh, his, his money where his heart is. So I will encourage you to look beyond and I'm more than happy to share the sources with you. So hold my feet to the fire. Get back to me, Ellis and Mubarak, and all the people that have organized this. With specific, I'll give you some pool that you may want to consider because of my opportunity with the European Parliament, and I pull a lot. So I could give you, it may not happen, so don't take it say, because I give you, you say you apply it. Mm, keep trying, keep pushing. Uh, and there are um, li li more little uh, philanthropic in your own society that you don't know about them. Try to up them. They may be women, men, people that have made it in life and really want to leave a legacy. Try to approach them. So government is amazing. Don't don't lose sight of that. But I want you to go beyond that as well. That's amazing. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, maybe for a final comment, uh, if you allow me, Jake has raised his hand again. I guess that he wants to make a comment concerning what you've been commenting on. If you allow me, I'll just invite him to the stage. 
Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Madam, I am, I am blown away by... Um, and, and Jake, please, not, are you here? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I can hear you. Uh, let's see. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. I think we, we got a bit uh we got a bit disconnected here with Jake, but in the meantime, uh while he connects, maybe um um Anson Tomatu is asking what can third world countries do, especially young researchers, to have community mobilized to have a des desirable change? Uh, so young researchers, I would encourage, there is an African network, as well. I don't know, in Ghana, they do have an African university that is also encouraging and paying for young researchers to apply. Um, but beyond a university or a setting of an institution that could encourage you, I want you, the person that asked this question, I think maybe it is your time, that person, try to coordinate how you can have researchers coordinate themselves, just identify who you are. You can be three, four, six, put yourself together, identify what research you want to focus on and do three things with it. The first one, I would suggest that you go to maybe your own local sources of either coach or, or individual or community. I don't know if you come from a village, if you're out, outside your um, you know, community or your town, or if you're in London, see whether there are other senior colleagues of yours that are into research that share the same research perspective with you. And you want to summarize your research and bounce it with them. Now that I'm at Oxford, I can tell you I'm now back into the research world and I could see the benefit of going back to my to say that's where they are, they are based, they are in research. So go to them and see whether you can earn their respect by what you are going to research on. That is one practical way to go about it. Um, in the institutions, individual and specific people in areas that are in your own vicinity. It depends on where you are, which part of the world you are. So you can consider that. The second thing you may wish to consider is the massive research with the SSN, the Social Research Institute. Uh, the Social Research Institute is actually based in Washington, DC, you know, in New York. And I am talking more from my perspective because I have been living in the United States now for more than 15 years. So I, I, I have done some social research network grants. And so there are our grants out there that maybe you could also help get it. But the Social Research Network and Social Research Institute, it's, it's very keen about some of this. So it's always going to somewhere to get it. But the last thing I want to say is, how do you generate your own funding within? Or how do you generate your own power within? And I'm trying to see how much I can do in my own side. To, what can I do without money? And it's something I think when we chew it deeper, we can we can get there. In a, what about if there is no money? Why why can't I do it? But I need money. I need to I need to put my food in my stomach. I need a roof to, to have my head on. Yes, is it possible that you could make do with an alternative? Say stay on the parent roof. Uh, and, and try to create your own power and say, if I have two, three hours, I'm going out to do some farming work somewhere. If you have uh, somewhere to do some gardening or go to a shop to, to help lift some things and get some. I mean, try to see away from other people's money how I will create my own source of income. And if I have a little income, I'm to create my own power within and push it and keep pushing my creativity. So that is that is beyond you know beyond what I will ask you to do, but you, I ask you to consider some of these ideas uh, beyond money. What can you do beyond anybody giving you something? Is it is it something you can push yourself toward without that? If not, then go out and see what is out there. Government is a massive resource. And NGOs could be a, a good resource. Now there are public libraries. Consider public library as a place you want to spend time. Uh, 
some of the chiefs and, and emirs and the villages attract their attention. Some of them still collect taxes in from villages, attract your attention to what they're doing. They may not give you money in exchange, but see whether there is an exchange they would give you back to what you want to do in their own area that you benefit them. So you can do trade by barter. I, I have this to offer you, but I need you to offer me this uh, and negotiate on terms. So these are things that just came to my mind off head. That's amazing, Awa. Thank you very much. I think Jake is back. We're going to try one last time, see if he can finally ask his question. And then... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, thank you so much. Please, um, I, I will try and get your email and uh, send you an email. But I want to work with you and see what we can do to raise voices like you especially in the northern Nigeria. Um, I give you an instance. I, I was going to fly to Kanu at the Abuja airport, and I don't want to mention the airline. I, they said to the women in front of me to step aside for all the men to board first before they board. I, I created a scene there. I, I stopped the boarding and made sure that all the women boarded and I went to the captain and I said to the captain, I'm going to issue a press release and put out the name of the airline for that kind of attitude. And I think people, women like you, I, I heard some of your uh, postulations, so I know where your faith lies, you know, but people like you need to speak up and mentor other younger women from Northern Nigeria who will speak up and destroy evil of putting down women in the north. Uh, some of my friends who are Amia have quarreled with me because of my position. Everyone is equal. And until we begin to drum that in whatever it will cost us, it has cost me friendship. I don't care. But the truth must be told. And, and I'll be willing to work with you and any, any person who is willing to work with us let us continue. What you said is absolutely true abso and practicable, you know, but let me also say to all of us on this call, three things you must be wary of and three things you must look out for in life generally. Number one is how you use power, power. Number two is how you use money, money. Number three is untamed passion for sex, money, power, and sex. These are the things that have destroyed people, and these are the things that has also promoted people. Every leader that failed, these three things, or one of them, brought them down. We must be aware of these things. Thank you. Okay, if there is no question, I'll just say last few words. How many minutes do we have? One minute, two minutes? Uh, you have, yeah, just one minute, maybe for a closing word. Okay. I think what Jake is saying is absolutely right. Uh, but I just want to make a caveat here. Uh, the North is a little complicated in a way. And there is so much push we can do. And I think it is right for us to push for some few things. When I was in, in court, the first time I appeared before a judge and I, I announced myself, my name is Hawa Ibrahim. Uh, with me, uh, there are many. And the judge just looked at me and was said, um, how, how, uh, do you know there are, there are men there? There are men in the court. Meaning, shut up, sit down. This is not a space for you. It took me seven years. Seven good years to have my voice heard. How? because I own the power of knowledge. I knew my law. And when I was absent in court, so the preceding cases during that time, if you might have watched in the name of Allah or in the name of God, one of them is a BBC one hour documentary about my work. The other is a CNN one hour documentary about my work. And I was passing notes I was scribbled and passed it to the lawyer. It wasn't about me. 
It was about the case that I was defending. If you have the first woman stoned to death, we are all in danger of what will happen to us. So we want to try to stop the first woman from stoned to death. So it's not about equality with men. Mm -mm. It was about equal treatment under the law. Know your dynamics. I will, if I were there at the airport and they said men will board first, the, the most likely I would say that as a woman with a baby that is crying, maybe we should have her to go first so that the baby can, they can settle. Islam accepts that women are the matriarch. So I'll come from that angle. That doesn't make Jake's angle wrong, no. I, I used to call the daughter and son of the soil, S-O-I-L. You know, you know the soil, you can feel it under your feet. So when you claim that daughtership and ownership of that land, where you step on, then you can walk within those dynamics. So I encourage you all as, as much as I know you guys have so much to give us and we couldn't see face to face and hug each other at the end of the session. I'm sending you a big virtual hug from Charles de Gaulle Airport. I'm in between flights, but I'm so gr grateful I have the opportunity and the honor to speak with you. I promise you three things, and let me reinstate again. Uh, as many of you as need the book, I will coordinate with Elise and Mubarak, and we can see how we can get books to your hands. <clears throat> the book could help with strategic thinking. Uh, it's never about strategic thinking, it's about what I did, and it could be helpful. Uh, the second thing is the pool of people in the continent that could be able to be a resource. I'm sure a lot of you have them, but for those who don't have, could pull into those resources. And the third thing and last, is that I could be your own resource. Tap on me, I may not be fast in coming, but one thing I personally am invested in is you, especially youth. I think tomorrow belongs to you and the continent needs you. In that time of pandemic that has opened up massive opportunities. So let us lay it out there and ask you come in. We think this is a good place for you to come in. Harvard had where I had been hanging around for the past 13, 14 years, had had this, um, this African forum and where I can get as many of you to say, these are opportunities that people are funding. They come to talk to us about it. Uh, come in, I need you there. <clears throat> so to tap on me also to see what opportunities are open to me, both in the institution that I've been hanging around on the European Parliament. Uh, I think the world is in your palm and I am all for you and together, we can make the world a better place for the children yet more. I love you guys and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Owa. Thank you very much on these words. I guess I will just ask our participants to follow us into the next session where we're going to talk about climate change. Once again, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Owa. Good luck taking your plane. It was a pleasure to have you here and enjoy the rest of the event today. Bye.